Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of WealthQuest. I'm Samantha Loring and this is our once a month series called WealthQuest Let's Get Graphic. Now we take a look at some of the most thought provoking graphs that we've seen during the month. We'll be discussing these and looking at the investment implications that these hold. Often social, economic and political issues transpire to drive returns in the markets. Now this of course is sentiment ebbs and flows as it tries to find the fair value for markets. So tonight we'll be taking a look at a collection of graphs that we found thought-provoking that during the last month. Maybe you have a graph that you'd like to share with us, so please do send us an email with your graphs to WorldQuest at abn360.com. Joining me at the desk tonight, our two strategists, Kobe Lakranji, strategist at Clickers Gray Investment Managers. And of course, you know him, Roland Rousseau, equity strategist at APSA Capital. Kobe, we'll start off with you and your thought-provoking graphs. Tell us what you found interesting during the month. Right, well, I mean, let's go back to the beginning of the year because right in the beginning, of the year we kind of looked forward and we said what are we going to expect for the market going forward from an earnings perspective and uh, I think at that stage Roland came up with an earnings number which as a matter of fact wasn't only his earnings number it was actually a consensus number and that was probably in the order of about 20 percent and I remember me sitting back and saying sure 20 percent is a big number to expect for uh, you know for earnings for, for, for South African corporates so kind of at the halfway mark or just beyond the halfway mark, where are we as far as earnings are concerned on the South African landscape? So have a look at the graph on your screen at the moment. These are the 220 largest companies in South Africa. And uh, you'll see that on the far right hand side, these are, those are the number of companies that haven't yet produced their financial year end numbers for 2013. So a, 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 a really wide array of businesses still need to come to the market with their financial year end numbers. Those that have come in with their numbers, how many of them have actually been positive? And you can see the number. About 25% of companies have actually come in with a positive headline earnings number. Now, the 25% that you're seeing over there all grew earnings by beyond inflation, which actually is actually a fantastic number. And as a matter of fact, if you take the average of those earnings, you get to about a 25% number. Mm -hmm. Hence, Going back to what Ryan said at the beginning of the year, you know, we're going to probably see an earnings number of about 20%, which was the consensus number. Now, on the far left-hand side of the chart, you'll see those companies that haven't yet actually, or should I rather say, which actually produced negative headline earnings for, for the year. And you can see that it runs at about 10%. Now, taking the picture that you're seeing at the moment, um, if we just take it a step further and we say, well, if this is the situation we're sitting in at the moment, what can we expect for the market for the next 12 months? Um, have a look at this graph. Here you can see the... Uh here you can see where the JSC All Share has actually gone as far as price performance are concerned. And the graph here runs from 2011. Here's the price to earnings ratio for the market. You can see how low it was here at, uh, through uh, 2011, beginning parts of 2012, at, at about 12, 13 times earnings. And as the miners couldn't come up with their earnings numbers, you could see it's shooting up all the way to where we're sitting at the moment at about 18 and all the way down to where we are at the moment at about 16 and a half. Now, if we think that headline earnings are going to grow by about 18%, which again is a consensus number, then you would follow that green line. And if you have a look at that green line on your screen, you'll see that your forward earnings number for the Johannesburg Stock Exchange is actually basically about 14. If earnings don't come through as strongly as what consensus suggests, then you're probably going to get a headline earnings number suggested by the red line, which is probably 15. Mm -hmm. Now remember that the long-term average uh, uh, price to earnings ratio for the market is about 13, which means that this market is actually quite richly priced still mm -hmm. relative to its long-term averages. Yeah, and that's what we have been saying for some time now. So uh, your thoughts on that, Roland, before we take a look at your graphs? Yeah, I think it's just, again, we must understand what is our market and what which companies contribute the most to those numbers, and they generally are big global industrial companies. So the mining companies, yes, are, are obviously contributing, but they're much smaller than the SOBs, the BTIs, and the, and the NAS purses. So our market is expensive um, relative to where it's been in the past, but it's been artificially held up by these global kind of companies. But of course, 60% of the companies still need to report. So that, of course, is one caveat to what we're seeing already when it comes to themes. Uh, Roland, take us through your graphs. Yeah, we, we just thought that we'd look again at the fund flows because South Africa has gone through quite a, a rough time in the last year in terms of the currency, in terms of our bond market, in terms of the, the equity market. So uh, we just wanted to put this in, into uh, perspective. And uh, on the graph you're seeing there is, is the emerging market uh, fund flows um, for uh, equities and for bonds. And you can see that uh, we've certainly seen across emerging markets a very uh, strong sell-off in, uh, in the blue line there, which is the equity uh, fund flows. So these are millions of, of dollars that uh, emerging market funds have allocated to 
uh, emerging markets. So you can see that as a cumulative graph, it goes up to $70 billion more went into emerging markets over the period. And a lot has been sold recently, including the bond market uh, coming a bit later to the party there. The next graph just breaks us down into a sort of a, a peer group comparison where we're looking at Brazil and, and South Africa. And here we're looking at the equity flow specifically, and red is Brazil. So you can see that Brazil has had a torrid time in terms of very strong inflows and very strong outflows. And South Africa has actually not been af affected as much um, in terms of the volatility. And recently, we haven't seen the magnitude of outflows that you've seen in Brazil. So yes, we've had a tough time, but it's uh, actually been better than, than maybe some of our peer groups. And what is interesting, if, if you look at year to date, uh, we actually have just over 24 billion rand flowing into our equity market when it comes to foreign net flows, and that relative to the 4 billion of outflows last year. So we're sitting in a positive position. Correct. Um, the, the reverse of that is our bond market, uh, which uh, you, you can see on the graph there, where we've had strong sell-off. But this is, again, not a South African effect. If you look at Brazil there, you'll see that they've had much stronger sell-off in, in, in their bond market. And again, the currency is, is part of this that, that has contributed to foreigners saying, well, we're getting weakening returns from a currency perspective and a rising yield, so let's get out of these markets. But again, we haven't been affected as badly as we probably think we have. Mm -hmm. John, I mean, that again comes back to valuation. I mean, I spoke about that a little bit early on, but if you look across the brick uh, about, uh, across BRICS, I mean, South Africa is expensive, right across the board. I mean, you can slice and dice it anywhere that you want to slice and dice it. This isn't expensive. So when people are talking about the S&P 500 being expensive and potentially, you know, kind of poised for this correction in the market, I kind of say, well, look at the South African market, which I think is even more expensive than the S&P 500. And that's not only true for that, but also BRIC. Yeah. Should we move on to China? Let's take a look at my graphs because uh, it's certainly very interesting with the WEF China taking place uh, in September. But uh, what I do find interesting is the developments in the healthcare space, specifically in the Chinese market. As you can see up on that graph there, you've got private expenditure uh, for China matching percentage wise uh, as a percentage of total healthcare spend, the same in the United States as in uh, China. So that, of course, is matched there. If you look at out of pocket expenditure, that, of course, would be what you're paying uh, not from your medical medical aid, you can see that Chinese are paying for far more in percentage terms uh, for, their medical, for their medical expenses relative to the United States and the UK. So of course that means they're paying a lot in cash and medical aid certainly hasn't caught on to the degree that we're seeing in uh, the developed world. Now when you see uh, that graph up on the screen there, you can see that in gross written premiums, uh, you've got forecasts there for the growth in the private health insurance industry uh, quite rapid there. You see that uh, growth forecast in the high-end medical space looking at around 40% and the mid-end uh, looking at around 50%. So uh, you're looking at that, the forecast up to 2018, but uh, interesting to note, if you look at the overall total as it stands right now sitting at 56 billion renminbi annual gross written premiums as it stands that according to McKinsey and that's still very small relative uh, to the overall life insurance industry where you're looking at 1 trillion uh, renminbi so so that of course uh, means that there's still a lot of catch up to play uh, when it comes to the health insurance market now just looking at the income uh, that you're looking at uh, from the uh, from the health insurance space on that hand as you can see up on the graph we've got uh, over there you've got uh, the four forecast for insurance uh, being a major driver of that and you can see that target uh, for the likes of the uh, South African uh, for, for the likes of Ping An which is owned by Discovery Health uh, or 25 percent owned by Discovery Health here in South Africa so that's the target that they're looking at right now and of course the reason we're talking about medical insurance in China is because Discovery Health is seeing huge opportunities in the Chinese market in fact Ping An owns around or has around 30 percent market share in the Chinese market so so that is of course what we're seeing from um, from that end when it comes to uh, their market share but uh, it is an interesting one to look at right now because uh, because at this point in time over the past decade uh, the the Chinese government has added or enrolled around 900 million people in the private in public health insurance uh, so basically you've got almost universal coverage uh, but what you aren't seeing right now is people uh, being able to afford add-ons being able to afford expensive health care and quality health care so this is of course where you see a gap in the market for the 
likes of the private health insurers. That's why Discovery Health looking at the opportunities there. Uh, and one of the graphs that we didn't see up on the screen, but what is really interesting, is the amount of money per capita that people are spending on uh, medical aid in China. So you've got healthcare expenditure per person sitting at $221 uh, in China, that relative to $8,362 being spent in the United States. And certainly what that's uh, saying right now is there's a lot of opportunity as people's incomes grows uh, to spend on a greater healthcare expenditure. So this is a very immature industry it's seen and huge growth potential and for the likes of a company like Discovery of course they see an opportunity to, to grow into the most populous nation. Any thoughts on China? Um, I think the uh, the demographics there are also because of the size of the population you can actually become a quite a big niche player and focus on a specific segment. Um, I'm no expert on China but if you're looking at the average age of the Chinese versus the Japanese versus South Africa um, Discovery probably has to position themselves very differently than they do in South Africa with the same maybe business model but to a totally different kind of target market but because the the, the, the um, size of the population is so large they could comfortably capture a, just a niche and it would be very profitable for them. Yeah. I have to put a value spin on it though because I am a value guy mm -hmm. and that will have to say that a business like Discovery you're not getting for free today you're obviously paying up because most of the market is seeing a lot of this growth and they're already seeing a, a business in South Africa which is doing fantastically well and you're paying up for that growth at this stage. So you're starting to rely a lot more on future earnings and you're saying the future earnings are becoming more important than the earnings that you're actually getting at the moment. Isn't it the next NAS person 10 cent discovery? Well, and this is why investing is an uncertain game because it very it well could be. It can still go up another 10 times. Absolutely right? it could. Well, and yeah. people are prepared to pay up for NAS passes at this point in time because the growth comes through and they do prove uh, right when it comes to that business model. That's where we leave it uh, for today's graph focus. And of course, if you have any comments for us, we value your feedback. So you can send us some uh, email, uh, you can send us rather your email with questions or comments to wealthquest at abn360.com. And you can also find us on www.abndigital.com.